Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something cool as always. Starting a new series. This is part one called Enemies and Adversaries. Uh, in part one, we're just looking at the book of Psalms. And you see on this PNG file that the book of Psalms took up the entire page. Uh, what you see before you is the left half is all of the statements that will be made in the future uh, uh, by the children of Israel during the time known as the time of Jacob's trouble, sixth seal through the sixth bowl. This is what the people um, are going to be saying during the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, this is what the Word of God says is going on during the time of Jacob's trouble, six seal through six bowl. Now what we're doing, we're using the verses that have the word enemies in them. And then of course some of these actually have adversaries uh, in the same uh, verse. But I've taken all the verses in the book of Psalms that has the word enemies in it, and you'll see why I did it if you really check out this study. Um, when you do that, when you divide up all of the verses in the book of Psalms that has enemies in the verse, and you divide it on the left with all of those that are referencing the future time of Jacob's trouble, and on the right you have all of those verses that are referencing the coming of Jesus Christ in the physical realm at the pouring of the seventh bowl known as the it has lots of titles but it's also called the day of vengeance on his enemies and adversaries okay there's a lot of wonderful cool things that can finally be understood by doing this study and you'll see what I mean and one of the cool things that you uncover is that the enemies of current day Israel, obviously Israel, like any other country, has more wicked in the country than they do righteous. And that's the same, with, same way with Israel in the last generation. Every country is that way. So not everyone in the nation of Israel is righteous. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what... The word of God is saying, but the righteous ones, the chosen ones from the nation of Israel, their current day enemies, especially their enemies during the time of Jacob's trouble when they are under attack by their evil neighbors and surrounding peoples, their enemies, the word of God says, is Jesus' enemies. And Jesus and his Father are one. So you can say the righteous within Israel, their enemies during the time of Jacob's trouble are the same enemies of Jesus, God the Son in the flesh, and they're the same enemies of Father, the Ancient of Days. And of course the Trinity is called Yah, the Holy One of Israel. That's the name of God, your Creator. Did you know that? So when you break this up, you really see that some of these verses talk about my enemies, talking about the righteous who make up the, that portion of the current day, last generation nation of Israel. And some of these verses say your or my, capital Y, capital M, talking about God Almighty, right? Jesus, God the Son in the flesh. Their enemies is Israel's enemies. And of course, obviously, I'm talking about the righteous within Israel. That's really cool. And it really, that point gets nailed home when you do a study like this. So if you think the my people, capital M, that God talks about all the time, if you think they don't actually live in the nation of Israel today in 2019, oh, you're wrong. That's what I keep trying to tell people. No matter how much they rub you the wrong way, no matter how anti-Christian they are, the nation of Israel 
the my people are the ones who are in the borders of Israel when the time of Jacob's trouble comes. Now, if the time of Jacob's trouble comes a hundred years from now, you might have a different group of people in Israel. But if it happens in the next 10 or 15 years, you're talking about the people who are currently there today are considered my people, his people, capital M, capital H. And you need to deal with that. Now, obviously, less than half are the righteous. We know from Zechariah 13, two out of every three people in Israel today are about to die. Father's only going to bring one third through the fire. Some of those will be uh, changed to immortal beings. The majority of that one third will be foolish virgins who refuse the mark of the beast. In fact, they're being used as slaves in the beast cities. They'll be brought back to live with Jesus. Hallelujah. But this is a really cool study. I'm not going to sit here on this video presentation and go over and read every single one of these. You can do it by yourself. I realize if you have a small screen right now, you can't even read these. That's why you need to download them. I'm going to uh, up. I'm going to add the links to this PNG file in the narrative in the comment section sometime today. Look for it today, the day of the upload, and uh, and then you can save it to your gallery, and then you could zoom in and out as you please. I really really think you should check this out. Take the time. The book of Psalms will never be the same. You, you'll never read it the same way. This is all future. And you say, no, this is talking about during the time of King David. No, it's not. And there's ways that you can tell. All right, this is all future fulfillment. These are the things that are going to be done. These are the things that are going to be said during the second half of the 70th week of Daniel to include the early days of the millennium while the battle of the great day of God Almighty is being fought. And, the, and here's an amazing thing. It, it, it should be amazing to you. It happens every day to me, so it doesn't surprise me. But the very last check right here, brothers and sisters, I know you probably can't read it. The very last verse in the book of Psalms that has the word enemies in it is Psalm 143, verse 12. In your mercy cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. All right, that's the last verse in all of the book of Psalms that has the word enemies in it right here. Here's, the, here's the, the amazing thing. Not paying attention to the number 4-3 whatsoever. What the Holy Spirit put in my mind when I completed this block was to make sure that I make a little note to help people understand what's meant by the righteous on this day of Jesus' coming during the battle of the great day of God Almighty, how the righteous will trample the wicked. Okay, and so what I, I left a note here in orange, see Malachi 4, verse 3, for a better understanding of the righteous trampling the wicked. And the amazing thing is, is after I inserted this note, I looked up and saw that the 4, 3 of Malachi chapter 4, verse 3, is directly under the 4, 3 in Psalm 143, 12. Now, most of you will probably say, that's a coincidence, but it happens to me all the time. This is not a coincidence. That's the word of God and the Holy Spirit saying to me, you got it right. And if you studied with me, brothers and sisters, over the years, you see me finding these numerical matches all the time. And it's Father's way, not all the time, sometimes we assume and we get it wrong. But a lot of times, it's Father's way, it's the, the Holy Spirit and Word of God's way of saying, witness, you got it right. Knuckle bump. Boom, boom. Okay? That's what's going on here. And I bring up the subject of the righteous trampling the wicked because a lot of people have a question about Jesus' coming. Do the, the glorified bride members 
who are translated into an immortal body, do we help fight during the battle of the great day of God Almighty? Okay, a lot of people ask that question, and it's a good question to ask. And a lot of Christians and a lot of shepherds will just run from the subject. They don't want to tackle it. Okay, Jesus can handle things himself quite well. He doesn't need our help. You know, you get a typical response like that. But when you study this, you see that Father, oh, excuse me, God the Son, Jesus, all right, on this day at the battle of the great day of God Almighty, he is treading the wine press. Of course, you see that in Revelation 19. But then some of these, it talks about the glorified members, all right? And it says, uh, we will trample that your foot may crush them in blood. Talking about us, not Jesus. Small Y, your foot, it's us. We will do valiantly. We will push down our enemies. So it's a great study to help you match it up with Malachi 4.3, Isaiah 41, Jeremiah 51, and, you're, uh, and Micah, and you're trying, Micah 4, and you're trying to find out, do we actually fight or not? And this seems to allude that at least some of us will be permitted to fight and kill the enemies on his day of vengeance. And you might say, well, brother, if that's true, I don't even want to know about those things. Well, that's fine. But he's given me the desire to find out the truth if it's in the word of God. So let's end this upload, which is really more of an announcement of this study. Okay, which I hope you'll check out. But let's go to Psalm 110. This is an awesome psalm. Psalm 110, you should know it like the back of your hand. Okay, this is what's going to be said in the throne room of God to some extent that you see in Daniel chapter 7 when Jesus is awarded the kingdom. You know, which happens at the seventh trumpet, day 1290, from the fifth seal abomination of desolation. You know, four to six weeks before Jesus is actually brought by his father. But the announcement of the Messiah's reign shall be made. And the three court reporting angels in Revelation 14 shall go out and stir up the ten kings for battle. So, Psalm 110. Boy, you talk about a chapter that helps you learn about the Trinity. This is it, because you need to get good enough, and it takes years. You need to get good enough to know which Lord we're talking about every single verse, okay? I'm, I'm not there yet. I'm not perfect, obviously. I'm still trying to get it right, too, and I make mistakes from time to time. But this, you like a challenge? You like to test your knowledge of the 70th week of Daniel and the battle of the great day of God Almighty and the millennium and being able to understand verses of the Bible and to get specific on when is the Lord God the Father, when is the Lord God the Son. You really want to test your knowledge? You with that PhD? This is the chapter to do it. And it also explains what is meant by um, the immortal ones, the righteous ones of God's family, trampling the wicked. And whether we fight or not, or does some of us fight or not? Okay, this answers the question. But it does much more than that in Psalm 110. You actually, uh, you need to be good enough, you need to be specific enough to where you can tell when God the Father is talking and you can tell when God the Son is talking or being referenced about, you know, and, and which one of the two is King David talking about. So here we go. Let's see, uh, let's check out my understanding and see what you think about it. Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, okay, Who's who? Which one is God the Father? And which one is God the Son? This is a New King James Version. I admit the New King James Version has pros and cons like any other version of the Bible. 
a con of the New King James Version would be sometimes it uses a format like this. Not always. But when it uses this type of format, I couldn't tell you the technical name for this type of format where everything on the far left is capitalized. Well, actually, it, it, it even doesn't even do that. But some of them are. Okay, that makes it a little confusing till you get good. But every time the Trinity is spoken of, they get the uh, capitalizations perfect. Like L for Lord, M for my, Y for your footstool. Where the King James Version doesn't do that. I love the King James Version. It's my second favorite. But the New King James Version. New King James Version gets every one of these perfect. So as long as it's not the first letter in the row, then you can go by it. But if the first letter in the row is capitalized, then it takes some discernment. Okay, now, the Lord said to my Lord, perf a beautiful example of the Trinity. Obviously, the Holy Spirit isn't mentioned here, but you get my point. Two members of the Trinity uh, are talking. One is talking to the other. Is God the Father speaking to God the Son, or is God the Son speaking to God the Father? And the M is small m because this is King David telling the people about this conversation that he got to overhear between God the Father and God the Son. How he overheard it, I don't know. Is it a vision? Thoughts came to his head? I don't know. But you got to continue on to see which Lord is which? The Lord said to my Lord, here's what was said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So obviously this is God the Father talking to my Lord, God the Son, Jesus, when God the Son wants to be in the flesh. This is what God the Father said to God the Son, one like the Son of Man. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now, what is that in reference to? Well, that is in reference to Father bringing Son on the day of his wedding, which is also the day of his vengeance on his enemies and adversaries. Okay? Let me make that a larger font for you. Now, here is Matthew 26, 64, which proves my understanding of the first part of Psalm 110. I, uh, this is Jesus telling Caiaphas in the council, It is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Is he talking about the great white throne judgment? I don't think so. I think he's talking about the day that he comes to reign planet Earth. So now the question is, is Caiaphas in the council going to be brought back to life? even though they um, are going to be cast into the lake of fire at the great white throne judgment? Are they being brought back to life uh, temporarily, at least a few seconds, long enough to see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the power? Or are they going to be given this vision while they're in Hades awaiting the great white throne judgment? And the answer to that question is, I don't know the answer. It's one of the two. In other words, Daniel 12 may mean a little bit more than we think it means. Or it's just simply Jesus telling them, I'm going to make sure that while you're down there in the pit, your soul is down there in torment. I'm going to make sure your soul gets to see this. So it doesn't matter. Regardless of what that means, we see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power. This is Father the Ancient of Days, and you will not be able to make out his face coming on the clouds of heaven after the pouring of the seventh bowl. Hallelujah. So that answers that question. So we can go ahead and exit out of those. So there we've just finished verse 1. Now, this isn't a, this don't worry, this isn't a long chapter. It consists of 7 verses, and we're going to make sure you have the correct understanding of all of these seven verses because you need to teach this especially when you're if you decide to use this PNG file 
of the enemies and adversaries of Jesus are the enemies and adversaries of the chosen ones from the present day nation of Israel. And you use this study to teach the time of Jacob's trouble versus the day of vengeance at Jesus' second coming on the day of his wedding, which blows people's minds. If you're going to teach this, you need to also teach this right here to help people understand what's meant by trampling the wicked or trampling the ashes of the wicked while Jesus treads the wine press. So to fully understand it, you need to teach this too. So let's make sure you know which Lord is which Lord. God the Father said to God the Son, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Verse 2, The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. The Bible does not put rod of your strength in quotation marks, but when you're teaching it, that's what you need to think of. You need to think of that as a title. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Okay. So, I believe the Lord here is still God the Father, just like it was right here. I'm sorry. Just like it was right here. The Lord God the Father here is the Lord God the Father here. And he is responsible for orchestrating the end of the age. He's responsible for orchestrating the marking of the perjurers, the marking of the accusers of the brethren, the marking of the wicked. Okay, all that belong to uh, the spirit of their father, the devil. Okay, father's orchestrating all of this. And he is orchestrating the sending out of the rod of your strength out of Zion. What is the rod of your strength out of Zion? And notice here in the New King James Version that rod is not capitalized. So you need to pause for a minute and really think hard. The Lord, God the Father, shall send small r, the rod of your strength out of Zion. What is the rod of your strength? It is the winnowing fan overflowing scourge. Your strength is talking about you're a warrior during a battle. Like, you know, you shall, Jesus shall receive his portion amongst the strong. Talking about him coming to plunder and to take spoil. And Father ensuring that he'll get his portion another on the day of plundering, when it's his turn to plunder those who plundered his people. All right. Three and a half years earlier. Uh, so the rod of your strength, small r, is the winnowing fan overflowing scourge. Mentioned in Matthew 3. It's mentioned in Isaiah 28. It's actually mentioned in Isaiah 11 all the way through Isaiah 66 if you really want to get technical. The rod of your strength, in other words, what is your weapon? The Lord shall send Jesus' weapon out of Zion. Think of it like that. Now also think of all these passages that talk about uh, his weapons of indignation. In other words, during the day, which is actually multiple days, of the day of the wrath of the Lamb, all right, his indignation, the Lamb's indignation, he has weapons. Father is, is basically saying, I have orchestrated, all right, the weapon. I have created the weapon that you're going to use to slay your enemies and to rule over the peoples of the earth. I've, I'm sending out. In other words, Father says, I choose the day. Only I know the day. And I am sending out this your weapons of indignation to include the mortal ten kings who shall burn the beast cities with fire. It also includes the armies of heaven, which immortal Christians are a part of, along with the reaping angels. And he's also sending out the worst lightning storm of all time. Father is sending out the worst hailstorm of all time, the worst earthquake of all time. So the winnowing fan overflowing scourge here it's called the rod small r of your strength of Jesus's strength it's his weapon his primary weapon that he will use to break the peoples of the earth so he can rule them with a rod of iron so the rod here is not capitalized sometimes it is in the bible and it's talking about Jesus specifically but this is talking about the weapon that will be held in the right hand of Jesus that he will use. Father's saying, hey, 
I'm putting this weapon, I'm going to have it ready, and or you could think of it as a sword, right? Polished. Father's going to have it forged, polished, and placed in the hands of Jesus, that winnowing fan overflowing scourge. All right? So that's what that means. I know that was going deep, but you got to go that deep if you're going to teach it correctly. So here it's God the Father, and here it's God the Father. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Now, if you've noticed, which I bet you have, what I do, if I'm retyping these into a PNG file, right, what I'll do is all of these capitalized word, uh, letters on the far left of these rows, if I know they're not talking about the Trinity, I will uncapitalize it. Like the Lord, I'll make, oh, no, that starts the sentence. But let's say like here, and will not relent. I'll take that capital A and I'll make it a small a to make it easier to understand. And there's no way that that could be um, a member of the Trinity, right? So I'll take that and and make it a small a. And some of you may say, brother, you're flirting with disaster. Father may take that personally and consider that changing the word of God. And you're right, I do have to be careful. And I pray often about that. And I believe that I have permission as long as the Holy Spirit is helping me to do that. All right. And if you ever see me uncapitalize something that you think should remain capitalized, then please let me know. But I have yet, after four and a half years, have I ever had anyone tell me, oh, that particular word that you uncapitalized, you need to recapitalize. I've never had anyone say that. So I'm assuming everyone's agreed with me. So this starts a new sentence, so the T would be capitalized. But here, I believe it's okay to change the capital A to a small a in this new King James Version. But now, when the Trinity is capitalized in the row, you better believe I leave it capitalized. And they have gotten it right 100% of the time. I've checked them on it every single time. And I believe the Holy Spirit has directed me to use the New King James Version in all of this understanding of the 70th week of Daniel. No one can, can convince me otherwise. All right, verse 3. Again, only seven verses. Hang in there. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. That is is so important. That holds the answer to the questions you have been asking for years. I hope you didn't just read over that. Your people, okay? Now, it doesn't matter whether this is David talking or God the Father talking. It doesn't matter. Your people, the your is referencing Jesus, God the Son in the flesh. Your people, all right, this is talking about the chosen ones from the nation of Israel. Now, don't get upset, Christians. Yes, you get grafted on to the tree called Israel, my elect. You Gentile followers of Jesus, on this day, when you're taken to the barn, the armory in the sky, and you are changed into an immortal being, you become the righteous of Israel, the chosen ones of Israel. You become my people. You're not separate from Israel. If, you, if any clergy ever teaches you, church, that you are separate from Israel, you are not Israel throughout the millennium, then you might want to consider finding another shepherd. I'm sorry. First, I would try educating them before you leave them because they need your help. They're working 80 hours a week. They really need your help. So try to help them. All right? The church becomes Israel, it would be more correct to say that the church becomes refined Israel. The church becomes true Israel on the day of your wedding, which is the day of your adoption into the family of Yah, the Holy One of Israel. All right. But this is talking about Israel being under attack during the time of Jacob's trouble. So your people, either this is either King David uh, or uh, or 
God him uh, God the Father himself I think this is really just the word of God you know this is what the word of God wanted David to write your people talking about Jesus's people of Israel shall be now again these are let me get more specific. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. This is not talking about mortal Israel who are unmarked. I need that to sink in. This is not talking about mortal Israel who are unmarked. 80-90% of shepherds today will tell you that's what that means. Israel is going to get a great victory and while, while God is leading them in the battle. But they're missing the entire point of the resurrection. First of all, you have to realize there's nobody left alive in Israel on the day of his power after the pouring of the seventh bowl. Listen to me now. that are actually located within Israel's border. The only people who are actually in Israel's border on the day of his power, Jesus' power, of course, he's going to be sitting to the right hand of the power, Father. But the only people left alive, Isaiah 4 and Isaiah 6, tells us that it's the 10% holy stump hiding in the mountains and hiding in Jerusalem. They're actually, not, well, they're hiding, but they're under siege. They're called the, uh, the foolish virgins who are going to be what's called the holy stump. All right, And seven out of every eight of them are women and children. So think about it now, 10% of the current population of the nation of Israel, there will be the only ones left in, in Israel's border by the time the seventh bowl is poured. They'll either be hiding in the mountains uh, or they'll be um, within Jerusalem while it's under siege. It's seven out of eight of them are women and children. So my point is, the volunteers are talking about the immortal bride of Christ, right? Be it seed of seed line of Jacob or Gentile seed line. Regardless, the family, the heirs of the kingdom, the sons of God, all right? When you're immortal, you get to choose on the day of his power, the day of his vengeance on his enemies and adversaries, you get to choose whether you want to remain singing, remain dancing, remain playing instruments, or whether you want to fight. So this gives understanding to that PNG file I created, and then you uncover, you uncover uh, verses that say, we will push down, all right? We will trample those who rise up against us, all right? This is not Jesus talking about himself. Your foot may crush them in blood. In other words, you're not just walking on their burnt ashes. You are actually uh, walking on their dead bodies before they're burnt and, and before they're turned into ashes. All right. Maybe some of them are even still laying there uh, gnashing teeth and crying. And, and they're in pain as they're dying. You know, whatever. So... I know we don't like to talk about those things, but you got to get the correct understanding of Scripture. And we also remember that out of this immortal people, the armies of heaven, this goes back from the last 6,000 years, not just the last 2,000 years. Father has chosen people, warriors from the past, who fought and died for Father Yah, the Holy One of Israel, for the first 4,000 years. They fought and died for them. He promised to stand them back up on their feet someday. This is the day they get stood up on their feet and they're back in the physical realm and they want some payback. And on the day of Jesus' vengeance, he's going to let those who wish to give some more payback, they get their payback too. And they will do what? What does the word of God say they're going to do? Their foot will crush their enemies in blood. They will be valiant on this day. They will push down their enemies. They will trample their enemies. And don't forget about Malachi 4.3.
okay? So people have heard me make that claim in the past, and they're like, this brother's sick. You think on the day of my wedding I'm dressed in white, I'm going to go kill uh, the en my enemies who are the enemies of Jesus? This is my wedding day, brother. What's wrong with you? You're sick in the head. I read the Bible. You read a few verses. You ought to try reading the whole Bible. Now, again, this says that volunteers from his people will be used on the day of his power. To do what? Push down, trample, come down on the necks of your enemy, that sort of thing. All right, enough said about that. But that's the correct way to teach it. You need to understand it. Now, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. So, is the you, all right, a member of the Trinity, or is it talking about mortal Israel? Well, you have your answer here. Your youth, okay. You have the dew. This is Father's promises to His Son. God the Father's promises to that He has sworn. And he will not relent. All right? In other words, he's saying, my son, this day is the day you get your inheritance. It's God the Father telling God the Son, this is the day. that This is why you went through everything you went through. Even though you've spent the last 2,000 years in the spiritual realm with me. This is the what you've always dreamed of, is being back in the physical realm and ruling the planet. And being surrounded by your people who you love, like family, who are literally your family, you know. Think about his uh, seed line of Judah. You have the dew of your youth. The Lord, this is Father, right? This is Father, has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever. This is God the Father talking about his son. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, are you ready to put on your thinking cap? Are you ready to be challenged? Finally, I promised you a challenge. Here you go. Explain that one to me. Who's God the Father and who's God the Son in that sentence? Or the first half of that sentence. Verse 5. Who's God the Father and who's God the Son on your mark? Get set. Go. Okay, so who's the Lord? So far, every time we've read the Lord, it's been God the Father. Here, this is God the Son. Do you see why it's challenging sometimes? Why a lot of shepherds would just say, they're one, it doesn't matter, don't try to give understanding to it, because eventually you'll get it wrong. No, you can get it right. You just got it right. You had to think about it for a minute. Don't worry about upsetting the Holy Spirit. He's your counsel. All right? You may get it wrong. A month later, he'll come back and have you revisit it. And he'll go, you need to take another look at that again. All right? He's not going to chop your head off if you get it wrong. But he does get really upset if you don't desire to read your Bible. Not if you read your Bible, give understanding, and get it wrong. He's not going to execute you. Come back to the garden. The Lord is at your right hand. Okay, here's King David saying that God the Son is at God the Father's right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. Who shall? This entity right here. Not this entity. This entity is the one that shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. It's the wrath of the Lamb, his indignation. Will Jesus kill kings all around the world, especially in the Middle East, especially the ones who came against Israel on the day of his wedding? Yes. Remember, his, his white robe is drenched with blood. It looks like he's been in a, in a grape... Uh, Oh, what do you call it? Wine press? A grape wine press? His, his white robe is covered in blood? Have you ever read Isaiah 63? This is what your wedding's going to be like. Do you even have a clue what the marriage supper of the Lamb really is? Read Ezekiel 39. Read Isaiah 25. Read Isaiah 63. Okay, the my table. 
And you even see a reference to it in the book of Psalms. See if I can find it. I can't find it right now, but when you see like my table, my dinner, my slaughter, that's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay, I can't find it right now. So get going back to Psalm 110. Jesus, God the Son, shall execute kings in the day of his power, in the day of his wrath, which is the day of his power. Um, but don't forget, he's taking volunteers who want to come down out of the clouds and come down to terra firma and do some butt kicking with the reaping angels. But let's keep reading. The Lord is at your right hand. Okay, God the Son is at God the Father's right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge amongst the nations. He's sitting to judge them. Who's going to live? Who's going to die? He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. The kings. Many countries. If you're a king of a country and you have granted your generals the authority to go try to take Jerusalem, you need to know on this day you will die. He, and you probably have the mark of the beast on you as well. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside, God the Father or God the Son, God the Son. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside, therefore he shall lift up the head, God the Son. Now, here's an added bonus to this understanding for those of you who have stayed with me throughout this, this uh, video presentation. Now, let's see if you're, if you're really tracking like a tow missile. Let me see you teach a class on this. Psalm 149, nine verses. Here's how you do it. Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the assembly of the saints. Is that talking about something back in the time of King David? No. No, this is the day of Jesus' coming. The assembly of the saints, the assembly, the entire assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill at twilight. What's that about? Marriage supper of the Lamb, Ezekiel 39. All right. Who's going to be the sacrifice that Jesus, our high priest, is going to sacrifice for his father as a wedding feast? Those who are trying to take Jerusalem. Are there any animals involved? Yes. The fatted cattle, the oxen, the lambs, the rams, the goats that these armies bring with them as they're trying to take Jerusalem. It's what the holy stump to include the immortals who are hungry after they've been raised from the dead are going to be eating on the mountains of Israel that first night. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. He's come. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. When we get down a few verses, you're going to see why I chose Psalm 149 to give understanding about the book of Psalms. Let them praise his name. Their king. Who's their king? God the Son in the flesh. Of course, he's now immortal, transfigured Jesus. Let them praise his name. Though, In other words, Israel that have been marked free and who are... This is the people who are in Israel. This is not the one-third of Israel. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. This is not the one-third of Israel who has been taken away into slavery and who shall return over time. Okay. This is probably the first few days. Now, maybe the one-third is starting to return from slavery. But the, most, the majority of this is the seven out of eight women and children of the holy stump. Of course, some of them were freed from Jerusalem and, and uh, allowed to go through the earthquake Mount of Olives Pass 2.5 miles east of Bethany. And some of them are hiding in the fords of the Arnon, you know, and they're starting to come back to the mountains of Israel, to Jerusalem. And it's party time. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. All right. If people tell you the children of Zion have nothing to do with the people in Israel today, they're a liar. Do you understand? Run from those people. I don't care the color of your skin. You could be green, purple, black, red, white. 
If someone tells you the people who live in Zion today are not the children of Zion, at least some of them, you know, be it because he says he's going to refine one third, one third of the people who currently reside in Zion. Okay, so anyone who tells you and nah, none of those people who live there now are the are are the people who are going to uh, rule with Jesus during the millennium. Oh yes, they are. A third of them are. Let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the temporal and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. It's going to start getting good. Keep watching. Then the saints will be joyful in glory. Okay. This, now are we talking about the uh, foolish virgins or the wise virgins? Because there's going to be a lot of Mark free foolish virgins permitted to live. In Jerusalem, during the reign of Christ, let the saints be joyful in glory. I believe these are the ones, the wise virgins, who are now immortal. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Watch this. And a two-edged sword in their mouth. Nope. In their hand. What are the glorified uh, bride of Christ? What in the world is the glorified bride of Christ during the first few weeks and months of the millennium, what are they going to do with this two-edged sword that's been placed in their hand by Jesus? What? To execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples. Wait a minute, surely that's Jesus. That doesn't mean his immortal bride, does it? Let the high praise... Let the saints be joyful in glory. Okay, so you're not going to be sad. Be joyful in your new immortal body. Sing, sing, sing. Sing about the praises of God, right? Jesus and his Father. And while you're doing all that celebrating, uh, a two-edged sword is going to be in your hand. And you're going to execute vengeance on the nations. Now, you don't execute vengeance on the nations for the entire millennium. But during the battle of the great day of God Almighty, while you're jumping around looking like King David on the day the Ark of the Covenant finally made it to the city of David for the first time, and you're dancing around in your ephod that's beautiful, white, and you're celebrating, uh, guess what? You're going to be like a threshing sledge machine with sharp teeth of Isaiah 41. You're going to arise and thresh in Micah 4. You're going to be that battle axe of Almighty God in Jeremiah 51. And while you're up there twirling and whirling and dancing and singing, you're going to be stirring up quite the tempest. And look what you're going to be doing. Executing the wicked, the marked tares. And punishments on the people. So don't tell me the saints in glory on the wedding day and the early days of the millennium called the battle of the great day of God Almighty are not going to be killing their enemies along with the commander of their army, Jesus. Don't tell me they're not going to be. But when you combine Psalm 110 with Psalm 149 and the rest of the book of Psalms, you see that the bride of Christ, if they want to participate will be used to help kill the wicked. In other words, the guy that killed your child a year earlier, if you volunteer to go find him, search him out with the lamps of Jerusalem, and you're going to go find that, in, that marked individual, Jesus says you go right ahead. If you want to beat that reaping angel to that guy, and you want to take, out, uh, take off his head, it's your day of vengeance too. The saints in glory will bind to bind their kings with chains of the peoples, right? They're going to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples to bind the peoples, their kings with chains. Are you catching on, brother and sister? You are the police force of Jesus. You're going to help Jesus bring the nations to their knees, those left alive. You're going to remove kings, governors, mayors, all right, judges from power. You'll remove them. And if they don't get out of the way, you'll physically remove them and they'll die. And they're nobles with fetters of iron. 
Okay, you're going to be putting people in slavery who won't obey Jesus Christ. And the saints in glory will execute on them the written judgment. This honor, this honor have all the saints. What is the honor that the saints have on the day and the week and the month of their glory? While they're celebrating, they are expected, the volunteers of my people will do what? Right there. To execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. Now, if you say, well, that's the one-third of Israel that comes back who are re remain mortal. They're the foolish virgins who are not glorified. Um, you know, they've been, they've suffered a lot, and they, uh, they're pretty angry. They're excited that Jesus is back, but they also want some vengeance and they're going to be the ones who execute their enemies. God's going to lead them in a military victory at least a few days after the wedding day. You can say all of that if you want, but that doesn't agree with this right here. Unless you're calling the foolish virgin saints as well, which could be the case. Okay, which could be the case. But it's talking about the day of salvation. It's still the day of judgment. I mean, the day of vengeance, excuse me. You got to remember, it's going to be a while before the Lord sets his hand a second time to recover the remnant. That's going to take a while. By then, the day of vengeance is gone. But during the day of vengeance, the saints in glory will have the honor of acting as the police force throughout the world. Okay, take it for what it's worth. But let's go ahead and end this uh, study, brothers and sisters. Part one of the enemies and adversaries of Jesus, who are the enemies and adversaries of the children of God. Hallelujah. Um, you learned a lot. I hope you'll want to go back and read the book of Psalms over again. Now you know what it's really talking about. It's not just talking about the time of King David and and Israel's victory over its enemies, you know, thousands of years ago. Oh no, the whole book of Psalms is about uh, the 70th week of Daniel and bringing the end of Satan's age to a close. Or I, or I should say bringing Satan's